everybody. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know. I think people people are still coming in a little bit, but that's good. Okay, um, so good afternoon, um, and thank you for coming, or thank you for staying, as the case may be. Um, this panel is called Power, Collaboration, and Lies. I'm Catherine Behar. I'm a performance and media artist, and I'm assistant professor of new media at Baruch College um, here in New York. And I'd just like to begin um, by thanking the Feminist Art Project and the Museum of Art and Design for providing this day, which is already, I'm sure everyone is like me, your heads are going to explode in a minute. Um, I'd especially like to thank Kathy Wentrek, Damali Abrams, and Jen Deardor for all of their hard work um, putting this together, and for the invitation to organize this panel. Um, as an artist who makes work about labor and who works collaboratively quite a bit, um, this has been a really good opportunity for me to think about the contours of collaboration now. In my artwork, my focus on gender, class, race, and technologized labor has led me to a view of collaboration which might seem a little bit counterintuitive. I believe that to understand contemporary co-production, we have to take uneven power distribution as a given. So while it's tempting to lump collaboration in with some other C words like cooperation, community, even consent and consensus, I think it's necessary to rethink some of the dynamics at play. And for this, I'm also extremely grateful to our panelists, Jeff Krauss, Larissa Mann, Sadat Harry, and Liz Flintz, as well as Jeff's collaborator, Stephanie Rothenberg. I'll be introducing everybody a bit more um, in more depth in a moment, but to begin, Thanks for helping me to think about this topic through each of your own work. Power, collaboration, and lies begins by acknowledging how hegemonic systems structure contemporary co-production. The panel addresses forms of collectivity, not only among individuals, but also modalities of collaboration or working together with institutions and systems. By focusing on the labor in co-laboration, the panel diverges from the usual utopic art historical presentation of 1960s grassroots feminist art collectives as somehow inherently democratic. <laughs> I'm just going to let that sit for a minute. <laughs> Collaboration is no longer, if it was ever, simply a currency for working among peers we are more often co-laboring in the shadow of unequal power distribution. Thus, power collaboration and lies seeks to engage a critical question with broad implications beyond the art world. How can people collaborate toward justice in undemocratic conditions with powerful institutions when systemic and personal in interests are not aligned? This panel also poses the additional question of whether, despite its art world popularity, collaboration is really the right form to be striving for, given the political and power structures we inhabit today. At a moment when the most paradigmatic widespread collaborative projects might very well be corporate social media entities, we can see how collaboration can be complicit with and even progress inequality. For companies like Facebook, the collective labor in this type of collaboration is exponentially easier to exploit while remaining unremunerated. Meanwhile, companies like Uber and Airbnb appear like benign examples of peer-to-peer -peer cooperation, but beneath a neighborly exterior, they capitalize on interpersonal relationships and monetize le leisure time, and their anti-regulatory lobbying efforts exacerbate social inequality. The sharing economy, sh economy should be especially concerning for feminists as we see Airbnb encroaching on domesticity as it leverages a landscape of high rent and Uber executives promulgating outright misogyny and disregarding the safety of women drivers and customers. <laughs> Delete the app, everybody. Um, when this kind of collaboration is such a dominant contemporary model, we should be asking, why is the art world pursuing a more misty-eyed, antiquated version? This dystopic idea of collaboration ties in with another, older meaning of the word. 
being a collaborator as opposed to being a member of the resistance. Of course, part of the feminist imperative here has to do precisely with resistance. For this reason, the title of this panel comes from the 1983 New Order album, Power, Corruption, and Lies. So I have to confess that although I owned this album in my uh, younger days, I had to download it last night. <laughs> um, and I want to leave you with a quote from the last track on that album that is titled presciently, Leave Me Alone. I see a thousand people just like me a hundred unions in the snow. I watch them walking, falling in a row. We live always underground. So with that, let's begin. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce all of our speakers in order now. And we're going to hold questions until the end, which we've been doing. Um, but I really want to have, I feel like we're at a point in the day when we really need to have some time for Q&A. Um, so, and just general discussion. So we're going to try to keep these presentations brief to 10 minutes um, and just power through the whole thing. So first, um, Jeff Krauss, uh, the first presenter is Jeff Krauss. His collaborator, Stephanie Rothenberg, was not able to be here, but Jeff will present on both of their uh, work. So Jeff creates software and installations using generative graphics, crowdsourcing, computer vision, physical computing, projection, popular web platforms, parody, and satire. His projects range from absurd critical commentary on technology to more commercial immersive experiences using new technologies. Jeff, rece Jeff received his MS from the digital media program at Georgia Tech in 2006 and then joined IBM as a fellow from 2007 to 2010. He is currently a partner and creative uh, technology director at Odd Division and is a proud member of the New Inc. Pro program at the New Museum in New York City. Our second speaker will be Larissa Mann. Larissa is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Music and Performing Arts Professions at New York University. She has a PhD in Jurisprudence and Social Policy from UC Berkeley Law School and an MSc in Economic History from the London School of Economics and 20 years experience as an internationally performing DJ. Her interests, <laughs> for reals, uh, her interests include analyzing the relationship between law, sovereignty, and creativity, and studying how changing global media networks affect creative communities, especially of people marginalized by race, gender, sexuality, and class. Her scholarly, creative, and, artist and activist work addresses how marginalized communities use music to assert and express themselves, and how legal, social, and business institutions interact with their goals and needs. Our third speaker is Sadat Harry. Sadat is a writer, thinker, and blogger operating out of New York City by special delivery from Guyana and Barbados. She has been in Salon, Model View Culture, The Toast, and Descent, and she performs with Body Ecology Performance Ensemble. Her current project is an interview archive artwork based on the experiences of millennials of color. And our final speaker is Liz Flintz. Liz is a curator and writer focusing on media art, networks, and emerging technologies. She studied art and communications at Antioch College, media art history and theory in the media study department at SUNY Buffalo, and media art and design at the Bauhaus University Weimar. Liz has organized exhibitions, festivals, and symposia in Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, DC, Olympia, Washington, Buffalo, New York, and Weimar, Germany. Liz lives in Brooklyn and is currently working on a research project about the radical media architecture group Ant Farm and early video sharing networks. She has written for After Image and The Creators Project. So I'm super excited to have this lineup here. And with that, we'll begin with Jeff. Thank you. Hello. So yeah, my name is Jeff, and um, I think uh, Catherine invited me here today to uh, talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the, oh, thank you, of a project that I did called Labors of Love with my partner, um, Stephanie Rothenberg. There she is. Um, and like Catherine, uh, Stephanie has a lot of interest in um, labor issues uh, related to the internet, and so when we were both uh, in residence at IBM around 2008, we started thinking about uh, projects that we could do 
uh, leveraging some of the new uh, technologies that were emerging on the web at the time, and crowdsourcing was just becoming kind of a big, a big term. So one of the fir the first project we did was a project called Invisible Threads, and in this project, I'm just going to talk about this really briefly. Um, what we did was we set up a sweatshop in Second Life, um, and hired workers to come into our factory and operate uh, these machines where uh, and people in the real world would come to a real world kiosk and talk to these workers directly in this factory and tell them how to make this pair of designer jeans. Um, and then at the end of the whole process, those jeans would be printed out on a large scale printer on this cotton canvas material and people would wear them. So we presented this at the um, uh, Sundance New Frontiers uh, Festival when people actually got these jeans and wore them to film previews, which we thought was really funny. And, um, so part of the, the, the idea here was that we were taking this kind of disposable commodity uh, and <laughs> um, yeah, so it, people would watch the, the labor that went into making this kind of disposable, com disposable commodity of jeans. Um, so, and then the next project, this kind of led direct, that, that project um, we thought of as kind of a tongue-in-cheek way to talk about a, a kind of potential dystopia of labor on the internet. So people, uh, in reality, all these, the workers that we hired to come into our Second Life uh, factory were kind of in on the joke, and, and, and we um, paid them and gave them, you know, uh, compensated them fairly, but... Uh, it, yeah, it was a dystopic view of what the, this kind of unregulated labor on the internet could become. So for our next project, what we wanted to do was um, provi provide more of a utopic model uh, where, or not utopic, but a, a slightly fairer model where the workers would um, have more uh, creative input into the, the product. And so for the product, we were, we, Similarly, we wanted to have a kind of disposable uh, commodity that people could go online and buy. And um, for this project, we chose pornography. Um, so this project, Labors of Love, the idea is that p users can come to the website and uh, they come with a kind of custom fantasy that they want to see made into reality. Um, so this is the, the form that they would fill out. They would fill out, they would uh, describe three kind of uh, fantasy elements that they want to see uh, kind of mashed up into their, their custom um, fantasy video. And there's other various settings that they can, they can uh, tweak with it. And then at the bottom, you can see they all. You can also choose uh, how much you want to pay workers for to uh, for each individual element of the fantasy. Um, and then when you're done, what happens is those those elements get put onto this site called Mechanical Turk, which was really big. Probably uh, not really big. It, it it had its heyday <laughs> probably around five or six years ago. And it's what's called a crowdsourcing platform. And um, what that means is that, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, anyone from around the world can come to this site, Mechanical Turk, and uh, sign up to do very kind of, l most of them are very low paying tasks. So like for a nickel, for instance, you can look at a, a cover of a, of a VHS tape or a book or something and, and uh, uh, describe what genre it's from. So th these are tasks that are just slightly beyond the realm of what a computer can do. Um, and so from a software developer's perspective, the reason why this is advantageous is that you can program artificial, artificial intelligence into your software. So you can program, if there's something that your software can't quite do, you can program uh, your software such that it will have humans do those tasks for you and then kind of incorporate that into your software. So um, when someone fills out this form on, on the Labors of Love website, what happens is that it gets posted as a hit or a human intelligence task on Mechanical Turk. Let, 
looking something like this. So that top one um, at the top there is, is, is one of the, the hits that was posted from um, Labors of Love. It uh, so, says so simply, find a video on a website. So once someone kind of clicks to find out more, and again, this is a, like a, a worker uh, from anywhere in the world who has come to the site to kind of maybe make a little cash um, or you know, to, 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 to become a, these kind of anonymized, part of this anonymized workforce. Um, and so they get a little warning saying that this is, might be kind of a, a uh, it's an adult, you, you might have to look at content on adult websites. And once you accept, you get taken to this form. And so your task at that point is to read the description of what the, the, the user has submitted and then go out onto um, any number of pornographic websites and find a video and then just paste in the link at the, at the bottom and it gets either approved or disapproved based on certain criteria. And then um, it gets accepted and the person gets paid. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, part of the reason why we, the, the, the creativity <laughs> uh, that the, the worker gets to undertake to, to, to find this video is part of the reason why we consider this slightly more, um, a slightly better like working condition than our previous uh, sweatshop labor. Um, project. So when the user's done, they get taken to, to a page that looks like this where they are, where, I'm sorry, so after the user submits the form, they get taken to this page where they get to see in real time as um, workers all over the world uh, look at the, the task and either accept or reject them and submit uh, potential videos for inclusion into the, the user's uh, uh, takeaway video. And um, at the end, you, it, the, all the videos get kind of downloaded to a central location and edited together with some custom software that we developed. Um, and if you specify, they will also get added to a kind of gallery that anyone can, can access. So um, I have an example. We, we, pr we first presented this project. It's actually only been presented a, a couple of times. We first presented this at uh, the Transmedia Alley Festival a couple years ago. And this was one of the videos that was made uh, during the festival by, by someone who um, used the website um, at the festival. And there's a lot of uh, the, the theme of the festival was when Pluto was a planet. Um, oh, wait, this one? Well, we'll see what this video has in store. <laughs> So as you can see, it gets very kind of glitched together. So what you, what you have in the end isn't um, specifically or extremely explicit. But it's just kind of a, a mashup. Uh, we, we like to think of it as a, more of an art object than a pornographic video. Um, so at the end of the video, you get to see the workers, what, what all the workers were paid for the video, and having this information about the, the process that went into making the video and what all the workers contributed and the process that they went through to find those videos is really an important part of this kind of artifact that you're left with. So at the end, you get to download that video, and the workers get paid um, however much you, you specified that you wanted to pay them, which is actually extremely well on the mechanical to our minimum prices the minimum that you can pay on our website is, is extremely high price for the mechanical turk platform which is uh how we can kind of sleep with ourselves at night um use, taking advantage or using this this even in that kind of artistic context using this uh platform of mechanical turk which can easily be kind of very exploit exploitative um so, and then just to 
finish up. This is a letter that we've got fr that we got from one of the workers who um, participated during the, the Transmedia Festival, and. Um, I'll just read it real quick. Thanks for the great hits you've been posting. I got one rejection with the note. The video has to be, well, I understand my error, but then this was the best match for the video we were looking for. I can't find similar video on other sites with more content, but the sp site specified in the hit that there are no video of transgender women with whipped cream with a duration between two minutes and 20, uh, two minutes and 20 minutes. So he was a little frustrated because he was like he really wanted to find the perfect video for this person who had requested transgender woman with whipped cream, um, but he couldn't find it, and he was also uh, a little bit upset that he didn't have enough time to fully do the research. So this is one indication that we got that it was kind of a success. We we had these these tasks um, that the workers really enjoyed and felt some ownership and really wanted to kind of contribute to this larger part, uh, uh, creatively to uh, uh, this larger goal of creating this fantasy for some anonymous user out there. Um, so that's it. You can um, find out more about the site and visit it at, um, at jeffish.com. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna just take this mic. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Thank you all for coming, uh, and thanks to Catherine for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, I had slides. I decided to ditch them uh, because uh, I wanted to tie the questions in the slides to my own research, but I think actually I'm just going to ask the questions, and if there's ways to bring those examples in uh, in the Q&A, we can, but I think they also apply to everything that's happened today. So I'm just going to talk about four things very briefly, and they are trust, shared labor, digital spaces, and visibility. So I basically have questions. <laughs> I have questions. Uh, the for, and it comes again out of my own work, but also from today. So what is a collective? What is collaborativity? And I'm especially asking this in the context of trust, because I'm asking, what is it that allows us to trust the people in the groups that we choose to be a part of? And how much of that is based on the comfort of white supremacy, of class privilege, of heterosexual privilege, of cis privilege. Uh, and that leads me to a question about how we think about comfort and safety, especially the racial and gender aspects of safety. And I'm thinking especially of um, the video from Dred Scott's uh, work where a white woman is describing a suspect and the way that specifically white women's fears about safety uh, play into racialized and carceral practices of violence against uh, people of color. Uh, so, again, how do we form a collective where we all trust each other and what does actually that mean in terms of who's invited and who's not invited? Uh, kind of connected to that is this idea of shared labor. Um, I was struck by the familial language employed in the discussion of different kinds of collaborative practices, including scholarly work, so discussing sort of uh, professor, advisee, or uh, dissertation supervisor, <laughs> supervisee relationships in familial ways, which on the one hand, I, I value in terms of thinking about non-capitalist ways of relating. At the same time, in those cases, we often do have a labor relation uh, of employment and supervision. And so uh, in some cases, familial mo metaphors can obscure uh, labor exploitation in really serious ways. Uh, and I've definitely seen that happen in academia as well as lots of other places. Uh, and also thinking familially, brings in, again, problems around race uh, and ethnicity uh, in terms of who's in the family, uh, in terms of are we talking again about something like nepotism or whatever the female version of <laughs> nepos is, uh, what structures people's choices to participate, right? And again here, I think um, we need to move beyond the idea of choice as a basis for understanding freedom. And I was really glad to hear, Jeff, at the end when you talked about how people were getting paid for the Mechanical Turk, because my first thought whenever I see Mechanical Turk is that the more unpleasant work is gonna be dominated by people who need money more, right? And that's kind of uh, how I thought of a lot of the sort of invitational, like let's, let's all participate in a thing, but okay, who really needs to participate and for what purposes, uh, including in these conversations, including in this space today, and lots of other places. So what are people's other choices? Do they really have a choice not to participate? What do they need uh, out of the space? Um, in relation to digital spaces, I know I'm going fast. I tend to talk fast, sorry. 
in relation to digital spaces, uh, I'm struck first of all by the fact that although there is a hashtag for this, uh, there aren't very many people tweeting using that hashtag. Uh, at the same time, for example, we know that Twitter is a space that is disproportionately participated in by black women and women of color. So that to me uh, ha is a revealing sort of dynamic around what spaces are representative and friendly to whom if we think of this as a feminist space, if we think of Twitter, which some places sometimes people mobilize language like toxic and aggressive, uh, what does that mean? Uh, in terms, in terms of uh, again safety and 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 also what it means to be online, um, and also when we're if we think of the online space as some place that's less real uh, and where we can forget about bodies because bodies are here in this room, uh, does that mean that we also forget interacting with people online? We forget their bodies and their reality. Uh, so what it means to when when we as activists as scholars for those of us who are scholars encounter other people's words or images online, what rights do we accord to those people? What autonomy do we accord to those people over their rights and images? Like, I found it on Twitter. I'm gonna retweet it or repost it or reuse these words because it's online. Because I've been really struck by people who uh, self-identify as feminists but who very uncritically reuse uh, sort of old ideas about intellectual property or property or the public-private divide when talking about online. So, oh, I found it online, therefore I can reuse it because it's, it's public. Right? And we know that there's a lot of things that happen to us in public that we say we should have rights over because the public concept wasn't designed with women in mind. And the same is true for online spaces. So um, sort of a question around, um, and especially not falling back on these old ideas around public-private and around what intellectual property is, uh, um, what it is designed for, whether we can rely on it or when. Uh, and that ties into my last point, which is about visibility and the question of who is made visible and under what conditions. Uh, there's been sort of, I think, a thread uh, here about the idea that visibility in itself can be a harm. Uh, we sort of talked about the word exposure a little bit, which of course has that meaning in it. Uh, visibility, even including representation uh, in uh, formal art spaces or in conferences like this, is something that has to be weighed uh, against the kind of harms that come from being seen or being hyper visible. And uh, I think this is really under discussed, these issues are really under discussed in the world of security and privacy. So what the idea that visibility in itself could be bad, could be a harm, uh, is often uh, a failure in that world at the same time that uh, feminism or some kinds of feminism have discussed being seen as a harm, whether you're talking about ogling or objectification. Uh, I still see the use of exposure as recompense for uh, your labor being used all over the place. And we have to recognize that exposure is often double-edged depending on who you are. Um, around the concept of visibility uh, and who is made visible and in what ways, uh, I think, uh, well, I think actually I'll leave it there for now and hopefully come back to it uh, in the Q&A, but thank you. Can I be heard? OK. Um, I'm going to stand up because we've been stealing for, sitting for a long time and I don't like sitting. But the most important thing I have to say is I am here so I won't get fined. <laughs> Three people got that joke, but I actually think that this was one of the best pieces of performance art we saw in the past 10 years. It was by Marshawn Lynch dealing with how he was going to be covered at the Super Bowl. He was a, he's a professional football player for the Seattle Seahawks. And he was told that he would have to show up at the press to be able to speak. If he would not show up, he would be fined $500,000. He makes $6 million a year. So I know it's a lot of that, but that's a twelfth of his income. Now, to put this in perspective, he does have media requirements. He has a fine if he does not want to meet those media requirements. He spent the entire year telling these people he did not want to meet those media requirements. Let me pay the fine and let me stay home. It was OK. It was OK. At one point, he responded to one press conference with one word, yes. The next one was like, thank you for asking. And finally, he was told even if he physically showed up, he would still be fined even though he was willing to pay the fine he agreed upon. They were willing to level an extra post-contract signing fine for his 
refusal to be obedient, even though he was following the letter of his contract. As a black woman online, as a black woman using digital spaces, that is an experience that is often true. My willingness to execute the being in the space is not accepted because of my refusal to be obedient. Those are two different concepts and they are often conflicted, especially in the idea of collaboration. I'm here so I won't get fined because I do not wish to deal with the problems of not having a voice like mine, even though my voice is specifically non-representative in a space like this. But I also wish to not deal with the idea of being fined or created in fine art. I'm classically trained. I have a degree from an Ivy League institution and I'm an opera singer and I have all of those things. My performance work is usually done on the streets, Brooklyn, Harlem, Bronx. But there becomes this idea that the presence specifically of blackness, I'm gonna bring a new term into the space, anti-blackness, is enough of a collaboration. Collaboration does not start from the idea of we are working on this together, but that we have met some idea of equality. The unexamination of the lack of power in collaboration is also problematic. Is it a real co collaboration if I can't leave? Is it a real collaboration if I cannot tell you no? Equality begins when we can set real and proper boundaries, and too often, especially with engaging with concepts of art, we define progress as tearing down boundary, boundaries or eliminating boundaries while not examining those of us who have particularly been addressed as subjects, never having them in the first place. One of the things that is amazing to me about writing online is it became a way of filling in space because I had an experience that was not common. I am from a very tiny, two very tiny nations in the Caribbean, Guyana and Barbados. I am also the experience of what it happens when the government intervenes in your home and removes a family member. I started writing this because as a feminist, there was little to no writing on this as an immigrant issue. This would have been something that was happening in 2005. I was 20 years old. In the nine years, in 10 years intervening, there might be even less, even as the presence of women in feminism has become even more. And one thing that I've noticed in common with the people who I've met online in general is that there is a need for the creation of an identity. And that in itself is an art project. Defining who you are, the idea of an avatar, of occupying a new nexus of space, is an art project. But for too many people, it is the only art project available for the reality of their lives. We do not talk about the experience of immigrant girls dealing with the deportation or forcible removal of a parent. We do not talk about trans women of Afro-Indigenous descent dealing with having to locate a job or changing their names. We do not talk about the experiences of a Dominican woman as a single mother mar mothering a special needs child who does not have access to spaces like these and places to accept policy. However, every single one of those people I named myself, a friend of mine named T-Girl who blogs under T-Girl Interrupted, another one who blogs under Bad Dominicana, are people who generate hundreds of impacts to the point of reaching millions of people but are not considered accepted as art makers? Is it because of race? Is it because of gender? Is it because of medium? Larissa mentioned that even though the hashtag is on the front of the program, very few people are using it. <laughs> there becomes an acknowledgment that a medium is necessary, but there becomes an unwillingness to embrace that medium if we cannot achieve mastery. Is our art only applicable when we can claim to be an artist? Or is art applicable when the art is performed? If art is applicable when art is performed, the next problem I'd like to bring up is, then we are all artists. And whose work is art? Part of this is something that I wanted to bring to this table is because I am a person who always defines myself as a feminist with huge, huge objections. 
feminism was, I believe at one point was said, it's like we use it because we're talking about the French term in 17th century, et cetera, et cetera. For me, feminism is more considering the first time somebody in my bloodline got on a ship and got off and stayed alive to make the next person. Because that is not something that happened for a lot of people. Being from the Caribbean, 80% of the people who got on the ship and got off died. So it is a matter of art and survival and mastery that I'm even standing here today. The mastery is not my ability to sing seven octaves in a couple of languages, but the experience to the ability to convey this experience in a way that is understood from this perspective. Too often, when talking about collaboration, the idea is that, well, we got someone from this place and that place and this place without examining, did that person have another choice? When we talk about curation, we talk about collecting these artists, collecting these people, but we do not talk about, does that person actually have a functional and available way of saying no? Can that art be shown in any other way that will provide them with money, support, and safety? Or are you the best of the most terrible options? And it's very comforting to say, well, we did this better and we did this greater, but it is less comforting to say, if that person was here now, or would they say, there was no one else who was willing, and there was nowhere else I could get this statement out without support. In, t in that way, I would like to problematize the idea of collaboration. Who is actually dictating the term collaboration? Who is actually dictating whether or not this was a moral collaboration, whether or not this was an equitable collaboration, and who, whether we had a dialogue or a monologue. If you are used to some kind of servant economy, if you're used to working anything like retail or personal service or personal assistant, you become very idea of performing acquiescence, of performing agreement, when there is a good chance you want to stab the person who's talking to you right in between the eyes. It is not a thing you can express. And if you cannot express your full self as you bring it to the table in a collaboration, is such a thing a collaboration at all? One of the things that is very important to me to leave you with is the idea of the singularity. I don't know how many people follow sci-fi. but. The singularity is, going to, is believed to be the moment when the machines become sentient and take over from us. When considering, as Dred Scott mentioned, that slavery was mentioned three to four paragraphs into the Constitution, please remember that the people mentioned as slaves were not mentioned as humans. They were mentioned as three-fifths of humans and as tools. If tools become sentient, then the singularity has happened. If, standing before you as a woman who would have been a tool less than 150 years ago, and if we're being honest, depending on where we were, maybe under 100, have we already stepped into the world where the singularity has happened? And if that has happened, can we continue to use the same rules we applied before? And I'm on time. <laughs> this on? Okay, good. Um, okay, this, this presentation is called um, Aestheticized Economies and Administrated Art. I wanted to note that I initially gave this presentation in early 2014, and I was using example groups that I had gathered over the previous four years. And some of those groups and collectives have um, now shifted position or dissolved or otherwise changed, so just uh, keep that in mind as I go forward. Um, I created this taxonomy of what I call artist-produced alternative economic schemas because I think it's important to consider 
how and why so many artists are finding it necessary at this time to create interventions in both the art market and more broadly capitalist modes of exchange. I also wanted to examine how these projects might be functioning as artworks as well as, and sometimes instead of activist interventions. Um, I, I don't really have a clear argument regarding how specifically feminist these groups and issues are, although I suppose an argument could be made that collective organizing specifically against economic hegemony is inherently feminist. Um, and I guess we can bring that up in Q&A afterwards. Uh, and also, since we're short on time, I'll skip some of the examples from each category. This is a longer presentation, and I'll just focus on one representative group from each of my sections. So if you'd like to know more about one of the specific groups inside my presentation, just ask me and I'll share any information I have with you. Okay. So the following are some examples of recent artists produced economic systems and interventions, and the groupings I've created reflect what I see as the project's underlying structural similarities and differences. Um, so there's, I, I just organized the groups into four categories, one being alternative or democratic funding models, two being experiments in extra market mo modes of exchange or distribution and parallel economies, three being warped iterations of standard market procedure, and four being sort of generalized agitation um, in the first one, alternative or democratic funding models I define as projects generally that generally aim to provide financial support for specific art projects or individual artists while circumventing institutional structures such as universities or nonprofit grant making bodies. Um, many of them use food as a resource for community building. And these are some, these are some examples of those. Um, Trust Art, the Artist Run Credit League, uh, Josh Green's Service Works, and the Co-op Bar. And, there's obviously a lot of information there, so if you're interested in any of those, I will give you more information. Um, so uh, one group that I specifically focused on was Sunday Soup, which is, um, was created by a group called Incubate. And basically, this is a model where um, everybody comes together, artists present different project ideas, and um, mm -hmm. soup is served to them, and everybody pays $5 or something, like some small amount, 5 or $10, to eat soup in a big collective meal and watch the presentations by the artists and then and vote on which project they believe should get funding. And in the end, the pot is sort of given to the artist uh, that was democratically selected. This is a picture of a Sunday soup gathering in Buffalo, uh, photographed by Bernice Rattle. And this is an image from their um, international network website of Sunday Soup um, <coughs> groups. So there's, it's pretty broad ranging. Um, so experiments in extra market modes of exchange or distribution in parallel economies I define as projects that, and groups that attempt to develop alternative structures for the distribution of art goods outside of a regular commercial art market. Um, and instead of like the Sunday Soup model funding the production of works, they try to um, figure out some model for distribution of goods. Uh, here's, a, here's another list. Um, specifically, I focused on um, Time Banks. Uh, Eflux, a, a group here in New York City, created Time Bank, which is based on a Marxist notion of time chits or time, sort of time credits uh, in which vouchers would be given to workers based on the hours that they worked and then they could exchange them, kind of like a currency that was directly based on labor hours. So like every labor hour would be worth the same amount of money. So if you mopped floors or you performed surgery, you would get one hours. For an hour, you would get one hour's worth of time chips. And so this is, the idea is that like all labor is worth the same amount, which is um, obviously quite radical. Um, so there's a lot of time banks now. I think that, um, Let's see, I have a note about time banks. There's, there's hundreds of time banks now. There's a, there's a huge network of them. Efluxes happens to be within the art world, but um, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's many of them have their own kind of currency and microcurrencies within communities. There's uh, communitytimebanks.org has a huge selection of these and you can even search by or by uh, regional affiliation. This is an image of the Ithaca Hours currency. So you can see the artist created like really creative uh, denominations for different amounts of hours. So you can see it says quarter hour and you could do 15 minutes of labor and get this and trade it to somebody else for 15 minutes of work. 
uh, these are Lawrence Wiener um, time chits or uh, time bank dollar hours uh, created for EFLUX's time bank. So, you know, these things are sort of, ironically, the Lawrence Wiener time, um, time chits are worth significantly more than if you had a paper version of it because they're so limited edition and he's a famous artist. Um, they're obviously, his, obviously his artistic labor is worth much more than the time that he invested in making these time chits. So there's, there's issues. Um, warped iterations of standard market procedure. Um, this is where artists produce versions of market structures like a store or a factory, um, much like Jeff and Stephanie's uh, Labors of Love or um, uh, Double Happiness, uh, where it isn't trying to distribute art goods specifically or make a separate market, but it's doing something that looks like a market but functions in contrast to contemporary capitalist institutions. And I mentioned double happiness manufacturing here. This is an image of um, Fawn Krieger's company, uh, uh, which was a project um, that's influenced by Claes Oldenburg's 1961 project store, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Um, the sculptor filled an entire storefront on the Lower East Side with sculpted versions of commercially produced objects, mostly made with paper mache. Uh, Krieger's version was supported by art in general, and there were there were art, there were objects by other artists besides Krieger, but everything was for sale, and was most things were relatively inexpensive, and certainly inexpensive for art objects. Um, and then general agitation; um, these are groups engaged in protest against specific art institutional practices that they see as unfair or immoral. And um, I wage then Al Steiner's group, which she was here earlier, is is uh, one of the groups that I mentioned here. Um, wage obviously specifically intends to pressure um, national and New York City-based museums, galleries, and auction houses into enacting reforms, including paying artists a fee for exhibiting. Um, this is an image from the uh, Gulf ultra luxury faction, which is an affiliate of Occupy, Occupy Museums, that's agitating against labor practices that are being used to build the Guggenheim Museum and um, Guggenheim Museum franchise in Abu Dhabi. So this is like um, a sort of image of a fake dollar bill that's a tiny protest poster essentially. And then this was a takeover of the inside of the museum where everyone's like throwing these throwing these um, protest leaflets down from uh, above. And it was pretty, they were successful in like completely filling the museum and infiltrating it and surprising everyone. Um, so, I, I mean, essentially what I'm, my focus is, is thinking about how um, these groups function not just as collectives and not just as groups that are, foc that are focusing on counter, counteracting the art ma market or capitalism, but also I think it's interesting and important to be critical of how these groups also function as um, artist projects and, and um, you know, in many ways these projects are what make up these artist careers. So the artists are also functioning like within the art market. Um, so yeah, that's it. Totally on time, you guys. Okay. Yes. Go team. So, um, <laughs> I was really mean in all of my emails. You have to be in 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, um, I'd like to, so we have time. What, what time are we actually finishing? We're finishing in like. So we, we have 15 minutes 15 for questions. 15 minutes. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So, I'd like to start by asking the panelists if they have questions for each other and then I'd like to open up to a broader discussion because we need that. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about your presentation about how there needs to be a choice for people to actually collaborate with each other. And I think that in many ways like, oh, I'm sorry, I think that in many ways like this thinking about um, these sort of like extra market interventions is 
a part of that in a way too, because there's no there's no like outside of of like capitalism. Like there's no way to like engage in the art market and making art in which that's not a consideration. I mean, for me, I think that that has different parts. Is that there is a way to make art in way in ways that are outside of the art market because of what you consider art to be. Mm -hmm. If you have considered a lot of the way your people have lived life for most of your life artistic and generative in a lot of ways, that's outside of the art market. My mother doesn't sell the songs she sings to me in the morning. Your parents don't sell the prayers they say at church. That still is a kind of art. But the other flip side of it is that a lot of this goes back to what you were saying, which is about we have to examine the idea of choice. Because one thing that I've heard come up is that we don't want this model of capitalism or we're trying to re-examine our space for money, but we've talked about this, is that, that you get to that space when you have a certain amount of money to already relax on. If you don't have that, you still want the money. And even if you want the money because it represents resources and access, mm -hmm. there is still that need of, you, we have to, I think, get much more simplistic and not in a bad way, but in a very kind of broad in our mind way of thinking about what is this art? What do people need? What are we actually trying to create? Are we trying to incite emotion? Are we trying to create disturbance? Are we trying to create resources and support? And I think that helps open up the question of how we will open up art, how we will open up creation. Because I think a lot of times we say we don't want money when we really mean we don't want the relationships with money that come attached to the creative process in the manner it is now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to jump in just because it also connects. I know we could clap after pretty much everything, but, <laughs> but um, uh, it goes back to a conversation we were having earlier, which is also about you know, going back to the idea of what, uh, what we're thinking about when we talk about art uh, and the idea that if you don't actually have the choice to engage in the art market, you're still making creative stuff, and this includes things like, you know, popular culture, right? So that's not part of the art market. It is commercial, but it also serves purposes that people here are talking about in relation to art. And I think, especially for people who don't have access to those other spaces, whether they're marketized or not, it means we also have to look at, you know, popular culture, at, um, you know, videos on MTV and wherever else, and say, what are they doing that we might think matters for communities who don't get access to other spaces. Um, so that's part, I think that's part of it as well. But po I mean, surely a popular culture is also part of capital, right? Like oh, I'm not saying it's not part of capitalism. I'm saying when we talk about how we evaluate what something is doing as art and what communities are part of it and who is included, mm -hmm. Right, it's not like the choices between f like fine art and museums, and you know pure non-capitalist behaviors. It's also between participating in other kinds of commercial culture, which also have these double meanings. Right, like we can evaluate these as commercial and non-commercial simultaneously. We can also evaluate, uh, a, you know, a, like a popular culture like music video as commercial, doing commercial and non-commercial things. Right. You mean these like the alternative the alternative economic projects. You mean you can examine them both ways. Right, like That's you were saying. I don't think it undermines them to say they they still exist in capitalism. Everything does, right? But more when we're talking back to Sadat's point about what the nature of art is, about how we what we talk about as being art, that's one reason to include, you know, things that are often not discussed within the fine art realm, you know, in terms of its capacity to do what it is we we're trying to do with art. But I think that there's other like the the issue is not that they that they can't be examined both as art and not art, mm. but that they they intrinsically operate as being a choice. Like mm -hmm. instead of engaging in regular capitalism, you can engage in a time bank, right? And you can opt out in some mm -hmm. way. And I and I think that that's sort of it's 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 not really a choice. And so I think that it's like yeah, know, I was sort of going off what Sadat was saying yes. about the what art is. Should we take some questions from the floor? I saw a hand over here. I think mics are coming. So, read it for you. Oh. Okay. I, yeah, there's a, there's a young woman towards the middle of the. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, Jeff and Larissa, one thing that I thought was really interesting that both of you touched on was that you were kind of able to live with the use of Mechanical Turk because you were paying wages that were more fair than were usually paid. Um, and so I wanted to see if you would extend this um, in cases not only of like invisible labor on Mechanical Turk, but in cases where people are paid to visibly put their bodies on display in someone else's artwork. So I'm thinking of a lot of contemporary projects where people are, you know, going on camming sites and, you know, paying the girls that work on camming sites more than they're usually paid, but then in turn kind of having them like other their bodies, objectify their bodies in exchange for the artist then gaining capital off of that, whether it be economic or cultural. And so I'm guessing I'm asking in terms where, um, like in cases where people generally working class and or women are actually putting their bodies on display in artwork, if we can still kind of find a fair practice in that kind of, you know, very much top down quote unquote collaboration. Um, well, just, just briefly, I think one of the things that, uh, again, made it workable for us was that um, we felt in some small way that the, that the workers were also had some agency in terms of what they were, were, they had their own creative input into the process. So it wasn't just about the payment, but that they, we, we wanted to create a system where they also felt like they were collaborators uh, in a really kind of twisted way. Um, so yeah, for us, that's, that was an important part of it. Um, I guess I would just add, um, I mean, what I think of is sort of a similar thing again, right, which is that there is, you know, being a chem girl is part of a whole continuum of people who are displaying their bodies for money in various contexts. And so it would be worth, you know, asking people who do that for a living what they think a fair wage would be, or trying to think about that in a sense that centers the people who do these kinds of work, um, you know, in other, in other contexts, or comparing it to what kinds of... Um, I mean, we'd have to know specifically. I mean, the part of it, I think the thing is, is that evaluating how things are going to work depends on the specifics of the bodies and the histories and the places and the people that you're talking about. And so it's hard to think about it in terms of a rule that's mandated by an automatic system, like a, at one remove, because it doesn't sort out automatically. It sorts out along pre-existing lines, right? So for me, that would be what I'd be interested in, right? It would be how you evaluate that in the context of, you know, there's people who are quite well paid to you know, display their bodies in various ways, uh, but that includes you know, uh, technically you know, technically unemployed wives of famous people, right? In a way, that's a kind of employment uh, uh, still because they're there on display, and it's not only their bodies; it's other things, right? All the way you know, all the way to folks you know who charge by the minute or the whatever in various contexts, right? So to me, that would be you know, again, it's not about the art part; it's about the the labor. <laughs> and there's also the assumption of a class betterment or not because of the artist versus the girl. I mean, if I don't, I, I need to hear what she thinks of it. If he asks her to do something silly and she's going to make a thousand dollars, that may not matter to her. And I think that a lot of that, especially in terms of when dealing with feminist objectification and sometimes talking about sex work is that there is an assumption that I am of a better class. So I know that this is degrading to you without ever asking for your mm -hmm. input. And that, that to me is supremely problematic because we do not know the background of that person and very, very easily that person can speak for themselves. I, I do think that there's like, I, I'm curious to hear what um, wage, for instance, would think about that particular question because I mean the whole premise of wage is that you say here's a, a set rate that an artist will be paid to appear in an exhibition. Here's a set rate that someone will be paid to um, to like speak in a panel, for instance. And like, so those things are, it, it does away with the ability of an organization to say like, oh, you're going to get the benefit of exposure. And like for a person that is like, whatever, performing, let's just say it's a person that's performing and take out the sexual aspect of it, like f it for another artist, like what if there was, in some ways making it be a set amount that that person would get paid, does away with the ability for for someone to make a, some sort of value judgment about how much it's worth. There was actually a really good case that happened, kind of exploded a little bit online, but Amanda Palmer 
and Leah Dunham, mm -hmm. both who have been heralded in different ways as feminists, and they're so exciting and great, were having tours and making money, a significant amount of money, over performers who they weren't going to pay until the internet got angry. And that was seen as, that was perfectly seen as a feminist project. That was okay until people were like, um, excuse me? But why is that specific mode of creation imbued as automatically feminist, but you know, Beyonce, we keep dragging her up and down a line in the poll about whether or not she's feminist or not. But here's one thing I know, everybody who hits the stage with her gets paid. And it's almost We don't have women. to shame anybody into doing it. And they're all women. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lena Dunham tour and the Amanda Palmer tour, where all of those people were going to be unpaid until somebody saying something, are feminists without us batting an eyelash. And again, where did the critique come from? But these online spaces that are not always taken seriously. So. <laughs> I have a question for Catherine about collaboration. Um, towards justice, you said uh, you're questioning collaboration towards justice when interests aren't aligned and the kind of unequal power distribution in collaboration. Because I'm a member of a feminist art collective, No Wave Performance Task Force, and we kind of take, we each lead different projects. That's kind of how we deal with a unequal power distribution and somebody makes an idea and we follow along or don't. Um, and I'm just wondering how, if you if you or anyone else on the panel has um, any kind of answers for how you do that. How do you have collaboration? How do you have members without, like you're a member of a collective? How do you have collaboration? How do you kind of personally deal with those unequal m moments? I mean, honestly, I don't have an answer, which is kind of why I wanted to do this panel, <laughs> you know? I think that, um, you know, in a lot of my own, in, in my own work, I mean, I would say, though, that partly where I was going with that statement in the intro is that I'm thinking also about, you know, it's a lot easier when it's with people, right? Like, you know, I have, you know, I have a collaborator who I've been working with for many, many, many years, and, you know, we fight, and then we, like, ignore each other and just do something or what, but there's a level of trust. I mean, this goes directly to what... Um, Marissa was talking about is that there's a level of trust. I'm really interested in the way that our labor is getting sort of dispersed into systems that don't have, like there's no person, you know, I mean, maybe we can point a finger at a certain Uber executive or two, right? But um, there, we're working in forms that are much more anonymizing you know, I mean, that's why I actually think that the Laborers of Love project is such a great project because it's really pulling apart the tissues of that kind of um, that kind of dynamic. Um, so for me, I think it's you know, in very, you know broad strokes, I think the the interest of any of these corporations is going to be about um, you know making money, right? And if my interests as a feminist or as a you know I'm very interested in a very broad uh, application of that term, you know. If my interests are in justice, then how do I negotiate that? Because there's something about, you know, um, this need for the tools, you know. Um, we, do, we do need to have some of these tools. We do need, like, we need a space like Twitter, right? Like we need to have a space where we can have these kinds of um, utterances and discussions and all of this, right? Um, I saw the note for two, uh, two minutes, so we have one question. You, um, Aviva has. Thanks. I really enjoyed all the presentations, but I have a kind of a globalized question. I'm thinking about Marcuse's uh, repressive tolerance and the idea that no matter what you do, the prevailing culture figures out how to eat it and go on. And I guess what I'm trying to think through, and maybe one of you can help me, is it seems like every bit is important, but they are fragmented bits. And so they have divided us and conquered us. And now what? I mean, I actually, I really like the phrase so solidarity with heterogeneity. Like, I don't, I don't know that I see the bits as necessarily, like I don't see that as a problem necessarily. Like, 
don't know. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do, but there's no reason to me why having differences, if, I'm not, maybe I'm not quite sure what you mean by fragmented into bits, but it seems like to me that's not necessarily an unpleasant place to be because a lot of what my questions were about, right, were the kind of um, uh, implied control and reliance on unspoken systems of power that underlie what people think of as organic systems of trust and collaboration, right? That is that often we're just devolving that onto the market or other places to police people for us, or you know, racism or, or whatever else, right? To police people for us into the groups that make us feel safe, right? And so to my mind, fragmentation, at least you know, maybe you know where you are. And that's sort of my question for going, you know, going forward as well. It's like, I don't think you have to, uh, solve or, or achieve perfection, but at least being honest about where you are in relation to the things that are going on, I think is, you know, an, an honest starting point for, for collaboration. Um, and I, guess I often think that the places where we have problems with fragmentation or, the, or see pr fragmentation as problematic are where we are having places where we're not examining power dynamics. So we see this idea like, well, we're split apart, but it's more like, well, why aren't you doing this thing I want done right now versus why aren't we doing this thing she wants done right now? Mm -hmm. And that's seen as being split apart rather than the idea of, I just don't want to do this thing right now and you are fully welcome to do it, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to be a part of it. And right. how often, I think, how do you see it, yeah, I'm an African, we actually did an online pull out of labor and it was seen as interruptive and disruptive and we were damaging the movement when all we said was no. I'm just not, not going to be doing the thing you want to be done. And how that idea of fragmentation was really, I expect a certain amount of labor of you be based on your position, and you are creating a problem by not providing it. Can you talk about that pull-out of labor? Like, what does that look like? Use the mic. Oh, sorry. I just, yeah. Would you just describe the, what that pull-out of labor was? We just stopped tweeting. Oh, there is a group of up, it was, um, it was a hashtag called, this tweet called my back, and it was based mostly on unaffiliated, black, indigenous, Latino woman who constantly ended up seeing our work in news organizations and journalist organizations and seeing ideas that we had been talking about for years suddenly pop up in academic spheres without attribution. And, and a couple of things just happened as a dynamo, as, almost as a do domino effect. And I pulled out, three people pulled us, just deaded their accounts, and we all turned around and went, like, no, let's, let's like, do this for a week. We're just not going to be part of the space. And if we are so unwanted, if we're so toxic, if we're so all of these things, we're just not going to be there. Anything you want to do, we'll, we're seeding the space back to you. And it got, it got very, very heated. There were people who were like back channel emails, were just like, oh my god, what are you doing? You're, impu you're impugning our, our, our system. You're impugning our movement. We put out one manifesto, and I'm in in the process of applying to grad schools to study the things I talk about. And literally one person I was talking about from grad school was like, someone emailed me and asked, were you coming back? Because there was such a wave. And mind you, this was a person who was in another country. <laughs> but there was just this assumption that the presence of certain people would always be there to provide labor. But there was no assumption that we had to be engaged about that labor or that we had a right to withdraw it. And I think that's, that was one of the big things that, with fragmentation is that when I call for simplicity, I'm calling for that moment is that when do we start, we have to really just kind of pull up to the point where we understand why are the feelings we're feeling around these systems happening? And why are we kind of turning into these systems where we're dumping all of our stuff or our emotional and intellectual labor into these kind of just open spaces? There, there's something behind that there. There's a reason why we're all flooding Twitter or we all want to be on Instagram and this. There is something that is happening, I think, on a very fundamental level that I don't have an answer for that has yet to be examined. And I think we keep trying to solve the meta problem rather than the root problem. Like, why is this one thing happening and how do we build out from there? I think that's a perfect place to, oh, wait. Are we okay? Yeah. okay, we have one more. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm not yeah. in charge. No. <laughs> uh, well, I think that um, what's also happening is the questions that are being raised here, I mean, as people are aware, but they become hard to resolve in the midst of what has to be a changing history. Um, when I did, I did long, long time uh, community project work during the period of AIDS, 
um, you know, the 80s and 90s, and looking for where that work would be in a lineage, we had to go back to enslave people with the spirituals performance work, where the cultural production was to create new people from the condition of slavery, out of it. And so here, too, the issue becomes the society is busy producing a culture which works to reproduce hegemony. And the society is also busy making a kind of commodity production of culture, which is called high art. And then in terms of looking towards history changing, the, the, we have to also be intervening on assisting the creation of a culture which allows people to imagine themselves differently from the society they're in and the history they're in. So I would just be kind of curious how people might respond to some of that from what they've been talking about. I don't know. I um, have a question. No, I don't. I don't, I don't have a, hear a question that I know how to answer. So sorry. I think okay. Um, we'll have to take that up during the break. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> That's the classic way we end a panel. We'll discuss it in the break. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.